stability here. I'm going to try this. It might be too windy. Let's we'll see how it turns out. I'm on the back side of the They'd have to come and investigate and try to trip me up and ask me all kinds of stupid questions and then claim that I'm acting suspicious when I don't like their stupid questions. Here, I never, ever, ever had any problem. And uh, I'm about as inconspicuous here as a tarantula on an angel food cake. But I don't get a second look. They don't bother people. You're not causing a problem, they leave you alone. Wait for their food and stick to the ship. Uh, come closer. Maybe that'll help the wind noise if there is any. Oh, I don't know. This is a nice neighborhood. It's all under construction, though. It'll be nice someday. Way back in there. I walked all, all back in there, and there's nothing. Everything's under construction. The streets are all torn up. They got whole blocks of buildings, big as these, that are all being renovated at the same time huge projects. Oh, right here, this uh, roundish looking building that you see. Uh, that one. That's an old uh, steam era engine turning yard, or railroad turning yard. And they've rebuilt it. They're not done with it yet. They're still under construction. They're making it into uh, some sort of uh, hoity-toity uh, posh Tony complex of uh, shopping and restaurants and whatnot. They've already done that to another one over near the center of town uh, that I've been to that's finished. It's opulent. It's absolutely magnificent. The apparatus treated uh, a bunch of us to uh, dinner there at a nice restaurant. Uh, it's called the garage or something like that. It's a railroad garage. It's what they're doing here. They're rebuilding this one back behind uh, Kazanskia uh, Bucks Hall. They're rebuilding the whole freaking neighborhood. They're really into infrastructure here. How's your infrastructure doing in America? Are they fixing things? I hope you're all right. Just an interesting little tidbit. And as you see from the title, uh, I have a strange subject. It's a little indelicate. Some of you might not want to listen to this. Uh, It's not that bad by today's standards, but I experienced an interesting phenomenon and I, I'm gonna share it for good or for ill. I think there's some things to be gleaned from it. Uh, whatever they are, I don't really understand, but uh, it's interesting. The lighting is with me now. Oh, now people are coming out of woodwork. This, there, this place is totally empty when I started and now it's filling up. Anyway. As some of you have been following me know, I've been trying to make it to Uzbekistan so I could access my money. I don't know if I'm going to. They, I can't get a visa. And not because it's not available. It's because uh, the quick and easy cheap one is uh, online, e-visa, and the system doesn't work. <laughs> it just wastes your time. I get to the end of it and the last part of it, it just goes haywire and I can't get it. If I went to the embassy, it cost twice as much and it takes several days. I got a service that's supposed to get it for me through the online system, but you have to pay them. It's not much, but I don't think they're doing anything. It's not critical. I got other places I could go. That was just my first choice. I'll know in the next few days. I also have a scheme where I can get in some of my money, a little tiny bit, but it'll help. It'll buy me some time. If that works, I'll reassess. If it doesn't work, I gotta get out of here fast. I've got the money to get my COVID test and go somewhere. It's all about the same. It's very much more expensive than Uzbekistan. That's taking a big haircut and I have to spend such a large amount of money to get access to my bank. But you gotta do what you gotta do. It's life during a wartime, baby. So uh, that's that. I've been to Uzbekistan before. It's an interesting place. This is 17 or 18 years ago I was there. I was in Tashkent. And roll 
going into Afghanistan, back in the day, we would go, we'd fly from Tashkent to uh, uh, the town across the border from Kanabad, Karsi. We'd fly to Karsi, <coughs> a little airport there, and all the older guys and the guys coming out says, wait till you see this, you can't, you're not gonna believe it. I'm not even gonna tell you because you won't believe it. That's what they told us. So, well, we'll see. The airplane you fly on, everything. They called her Old Smoky. And uh, we were waiting on the airplane and there it is up in the sky, it's coming. Everybody's anticipating, especially guys that have been in an hour regularly. Oh, wait till you see this, this is great. And uh, way off in the distance, you see this trail of black smoke coming toward you. And then you can make out a pretty large plane. I think it was a tuple off. It was a tuple off. Uh, rough takeoff and landing. I don't remember the designation. I'll have to look it up. I forgot. I think it was a 124. But it had the big giant tires and two engines, turboprop. I think it was like a 20 or 30 passenger plane. It comes in, and that one engine, the one on the right from the pilot's, pilot's perspective, was smoking, black smoke, he's just rolling out of it. And he shut it off, the smoke stopped, and the prop stopped, and then he came in on one prop. He landed, pulled up, people got out, we went to it to get in. Mechanics came running up to it and set up step ladders and scattered tools all over the wing and started working on the right engine. And buckets of oil, black used oil was pouring on the ground. I noticed they had among their tools, uh, like there was a claw hammer there. One of them's got a claw hammer laying on on the on the uh, wing. They were Uzbek mechanics. I'm sure they're very competent and knew what they were doing. They're making it, preparing it to make another sortie, apparently. And uh, as we got on, I noticed these huge off-road balloon tires were uh, worn down to the cords. I didn't count them, but there's at least three or four layers of cords that you can see, you know, how they incrementally get smaller the way they wear. Got on it, and I sat on the right, looked out the window and watched the mechanics, and they were arguing, real passionate arguments about something, and they're waving tools at each other. It doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, but uh, hey, you know, you see stuff like that, other people have been doing it, didn't bother them any, they're still around. You buy the ticket and take the ride. I'm not getting paid all this money to, uh, you know, live in a safe little cubicle and uh, believe in fantasies. Uh, you see stuff like that? I, I get to me it was just confirmation I'm living the dream. All right. They finally stopped arguing and put the covers back on, and we took off. Smoke starts rolling out of that engine again, and uh, we flew to uh, uh, Carsey. And we got there and that airport was amazing. Uh, the Soviet Union had collapsed in uh, like the late 80s, early 90s, around 1990 or so. I think there was probably maintenance problems before that happened. And the powers that be, the people that had control and, uh, and, and uh, were entrusted with the airport, apparently were building nice houses and dodges and they needed the tiles from the floor and uh, a lot of the other infrastructure, and it all been ripped out. The place is uh, a shell, uh, dirt floor. I thought it just hadn't been cleaned in a long time. Then I noticed there's the tiles. They used to have tiles. You could see they used to be in there, and they just pulled them out. And then they didn't bother to sweep it or anything. People track in snow and mud, and then it dries, and it just stays there. Uh, it was impressive. Well, then we got on a bus and went out to the base and were stuck there for several days. I think I was stuck there for over like 10 days once. Had been stuck in uh, Tashkent for several days as well, but that was in a five-star hotel. There's a contrast, you know, I mean, it really was at least a four-star hotel. It was opulent, it was beautiful. The service is a, there's a, hi, Mr. Pigeon, I don't have anything to give you. I probably wouldn't give you anyway. Flying rats, or flying rats, anyway. This hotel, I've been in five-star restaurants before. In Houston, I made a lot of money. I dated. I would go to the Colombe d'Or or some of the other places. I'd put on my nice clothes and go to those places and enjoy it. I know what the service is like. 
the waiters are like wraiths. They're like ghosts. You don't even know they're there. If you drop a crumb, suddenly this little silver flash happens and a little silver card comes around and swiftly uh, scoops it off the table. You know, your water is automatically refilled with water and ice and you don't even see it. You know, you just look down and it's full again. That's the way they were at Tashkent. Absolutely fantastic. Every detail of the service, every detail of the place it was popular. And then you go to Canabad to the, or uh, Car seat to the airport. <laughs> uh, stark contrast, anyway. Uh, you're living the dream. Anyhow, I'm in and out of there. I ended up going back to Carsey Airport in winter. It's very cold, snow's on the ground. And uh, I was told about the restrooms, bathrooms. This is the main point of this video, for good or for ill. Soviet infrastructure, be it box halls, airports, bus stations, metro, where you find a public restroom, and they're kind of rare, when you do find one, it's generally underground. You go downstairs, and it's not just one floor down either. Some of them, you just go down and down and down and down into deep sub-basement. Why they did that, I don't know. I suppose maybe they're supposed to serve as uh, bunkers for when uh, Uncle Sugar tries to nuke them. Maybe that was it, but they're way down there, and they were way down there in uh, Carsey. And I was told that it's unbelievable. And I was also told, do not go down there under any circumstances. Do anything to avoid it. Well, then they tell you that and they dump you off at the airport and you're there for 12 or 14 hours waiting on a plane that never comes. And then you go back to the base. So guess what happened? I had to go number one, whatever that is. Okay, I go outside, man, no problem. I go out there. Every 50 meters, there's a gang of cops. And they're pacing back and forth in front of the place. There's no bushes, there's no nooks and crannies, there's no corners. If I would known what I know now, I, pro I probably would have just done it because, you know, it's Central Asia and, well, in a lot of Europe, it's, it's common. You just do that in public, it's no big deal. It's not like they'll arrest you for indecent exposure and then charge you as a sex offender like they do in the U.S. <laughs> nah, public, uh, public urination is not that big a deal. But I wasn't going to do it because those, those guys were, they were always looking for some reason to mess with you. And uh, so I chose to, ah, how bad can it be? I'm going to go down to the public restroom, right? How bad can it be? <laughs> I'm glad I did because, I don't know. Like I said, this contrast from five star to uh, indescribably dysfunctional <laughs> uh, infrastructure. No, why not intensify it? Might learn something, right? I try to make a philosophical argument for things I do, both before and after. I went back in, I found the restroom, it had a sign on it, the staircase, of course, going down, I'm going down the stairs, going down the stairs, going down, 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 way down. It was probably one of the longest, deepest ones I've ever seen, and I've seen a few of them around here. And uh, as I got down to a point, an interesting phenomenon began to occur. I, I could make out the barely detectable haze, a greenish haze. It was like a liquid. It was like... It was like a floor, but it's translucent. Yeah, well, it was, it was beyond translucent. It's just barely visible, but it was visible. It was distinctly visible, a green haze level uh, at the last flight of stairs. And when I stepped into it, when I stepped into it, it was warm. There's definitely a thermal layer that was starkly contrasted to what I was going down into. The place wasn't heated. The, the, ho the, the, the airport was, there was no heat because somebody stole all the heaters and the pipes and everything. Uh, it was like 20 degrees out. And it's cold, it's freaking cold. But when I went down those stairs, when I stepped into the green haze, instantly it was like stepping into a warm bath. It was that different. And as I slowly walked down into it and it rose up, it was warm. It wasn't just 
warmer. It was freaking warm. And I got up to about here and I took a real deep breath. I closed my eyes and I went down into it. I got down to the bottom. I didn't step off on the floor. And it was like a typical Soviet era restroom. It was like a gymnasium with rows and rows of squat toilets up on platforms with like little hallways in between them. No dividers. Communal thing. And uh, I wasn't going in <laughs> because you couldn't see the squat toilets. I know it's supposed to be there, but you couldn't see any of it because it was under basically, uh, you're, you're seeing a field have been windrowed. This is windrows, windrows. But it, it was windrows of feces, about 20 inches deep, about three and a half, four feet wide, slumped, covering each row of squat toilets. And the hallways between them, between the elevated platforms, was about six inches deep in a yellowish, brownish, blackish, brackish uh, liquid, which I assume was partially the runoff moisture from the feces and partially urine from people pissing in the place. Apparently those pumps hadn't worked in 20 years and people just continued to go down there and fill it. It's just about full. You know, there wasn't really any place to go if you had to go number two, which I fortunately didn't. Uh, I just stood on the stairs and took a whiz right there. Uh, it was fascinating. I can go into a lot of detail because I, I, I noticed everything. It's these piles around the edges of the piles. A very, very large area, probably about 8 or 10 inches of the edge of the pile, was purple crystals. Pure potassium nitrate. This stuff's been there a while. It was beautiful. I mean, it was kind of iridescent and it had little, like, crystals were growing up out of it, like stems. And kind of shiny. Potassium nitrate's what they get out of bat caves. It's made from pure bat crap with pressure and time. You make these beautiful purple crystals that are ground up to make gunpowder. I, I contemplated as long as I could, but then I had to breathe. And it was it was it was like an acid trip. The colors I saw colors down there I'd never seen before. <laughs> it was amazing. I'm glad I went, but uh, I get to share it with you now, for good or for ill. I, I, I had I really had to breathe, but I didn't want to move. I wanted to just take this in and look at it, especially the colors, the crystals, the purple. It wasn't just purple either. It was like this uh, unnatural acid color. I, I don't know. It's it's hard to describe. I I know about that stuff just a little bit enough to know that there's colors that don't exist in nature that you can see, and they were there. They were in that restroom, in that in that water closet, in that public facility. I pulled my shirt up over my nose and tried to take a breath and it kind of hurt. <clears throat> so I ran out of there. I, as I ran up, it got cold. I merged into the cold. It just went right down. And I felt like I was dripping with something. I didn't see any visible. I didn't see any sort of uh, accumulation or moisture or uh, oil on me. Uh, I wanted to take a shower really bad, but where am I going to do that at? <laughs> Maybe they got a shower there at the airport, right? But anyway, that's just something that happened for your contemplation. I hope you found it amusing. I hope you weren't offended by it. But if you are, I told you before I started, you might not want to listen to this. You probably find a metaphor for that somewhere and what's happening to the world today. Oh, I really wanted to go back. Uh, not just to get my money, but to look around and see what's changed in 17 years. I hope they give me that visa. <sighs> but we'll see. Also, Canabad is not very... Oh, excuse me. I keep saying Canabad. That's in Afghanistan. Across the border is Karsi. Karsi is not far from Samarkand. I always wanted to go there. It's, uh, I think, the model for Xanadu. And Kublai Khan did... Uh, and Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. That's, that's apt at the end of this description of what I saw at the public restroom. <clears throat> anyway, I mean, you would have had to been there, I guess. 
I'd like to go to Samaritan. If I don't get the visa, I'm on plan B. But uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Got something out of it, for good or for ill. Please uh, give me your comments. And I'll, I'll try to get something a little, uh, a, a little more, uh, I don't know, universal next time. But I just wanted to tell that story because I've never told it to anyone before. Uncle Bildy, signing out. Oh, I almost forgot to mention. When we landed on Old Smoky in Carsey, there's a crashed airplane by the side of the runway. They just kind of pushed it off and left it there. And you see all kinds of things that inspire confidence. And what's really funny was I got back to Tashkent after like my four month tour or whatever, my four month contract, or my four month between vacations that I had to take. When I went back to Tashkent, I bumped into a guy at the hotel bar who was uh, the poor guy. He just was exasperated, and he seemed like he was he was uh, he'd been through hell. And I asked him what he what he's up to, what he's doing. He's he, from like I told from what he's talking. He's flying around all these airports in Central Asia, and he said he was an airport inspector. <laughs> the uh, I don't know who the the your EU the or NATO or the NGO somebody was sending this poor guy around to inspect these airports like they had at at uh, at Carsey and he seemed like he's a pretty gloomy and frustrated guy and he's on his way to Carsey right then and uh, I didn't say nothing I just said uh, you know, well you're gonna be impressed bud you're gonna be impressed I want to see what it looks like now. Maybe I'll get to go. Maybe not this time, maybe some other time in the future. Like killing several birds with one stone, though. It's getting hard to do. Okay, I'm really signing out now. Uncle Wildy, signing out for real. Take care, and God bless.